Ali. Okay, perfect. Well, um, I'm sure we'll have uh, more people jumping in. I'll just add them as they come. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to today's uh, Brown Bag uh, lecture as part of the um, Summer Nahuatl program at the University of Utah in partner with EBS. Um, so today uh, um, we'll go ahead and we'll do things um, as we normally do. We'll first kind of have an intro um, to our speaker in Nahuatl, um, and then I will do that introduction in English and then we will turn the time over. Um, today, we're honored to have Luciano Marzulli with us, who speaks Nahuatl, and he'll be helping out with uh, that part. So I'll go ahead and turn the time over to, to Lou to go ahead and introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Tlaskamati, Kerry, Kelly, Juan Kualitiotlak, Nanotoka, Lou, Juan Nitakiti, Nika Center for Latin American Studies, Ipawai, Kaltlamashtiloya, Tlen, Utah. Tlaskamati, Pampa, Timo, Sanse, Coltilia. The Center for Latin American Studies, Ipa Wei Katlamashtiloya Tlen Utah, Kiekana Ni Tlapanestilisli, Tlen Kichiwa Shishiwit, Ni Sanilisli Eli Tlen Tlamashtilisli, Tlen Nawa, Tlen Mochiwa Shishiwit, Juania Tlamashtiani Tlen Idies. Tohuanti. Tikneki ti tla tla palehuise ika tlate temolisli ika masewan tla la mikayot. Yaka class ki ekana ni tla paneshtilisli, Juan Yasekin tla paneshtiani, kense tla mastiani, tlen nawat, tla mastiani tlen weikal tla mastiloyan tlen Utah. Tlamastiani tlen seyo kal tlamastiloya, mamastiani tlen nawa, tlen nama, wan tlen panotokehia. Nama tlawel tiol paktoke, pampa istok tohuanya, Dr. Jeff Pines. Ya tech, ya tech nech tilis, ika itlate temolis, ika kenihi. Motekpana nawa tla quiloli. Dr. Jeff Pines, kipia se bachillerato y calinguistica, pan UC Berkeley, Juan se doctorado, pan linguistica y pan wei katla mastiloya tlen Utah. Yanojia, kieka antok tekit tlen tlate temolisli, Juan pashalo lisli y ka masewal tlatoli. Tlen Norte Tlali, Juan Centro Tlali. Tlen Nel Mopaneshtia, Nahuat, Juan Shoshoni. Jeff Kioltilana, Juan Tekiti, Ica Lingüística, Tlen Nahuat, Juan Kichichtok, Tla Temolis Lisli, Ica Nahuat. Y Tla Temolis mo temachtia ika tlapanilisli i pan tlachiwalisli. Kenihi mo to kashtia i shkopinkayot. Kenihi mo tekpana tlakuilolisli. Juan nawat, Juan tlen mo pohua, Juan mo ikuiloa tlen nama. Nama ki temachtia i teki ika Tlato kual palisli. Ashtoi tikon kakise i tlapanestilis wan teipa tikpiase maktlakli pil kawitsitsi kampa ti chiwilis se tlatlanilisli. Nama nikpanoltilis tlatoli Dr. Jeff Pines. Tlaskamati. All right, and actually, uh, we'll go ahead and just uh, introduce uh, Jeff real quick in, in English. Um, thank you to everybody who uh, recently uh, jumped on. Um, the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Utah holds um, brown bag lectures as part of the Summer Nahuatl um, Language and Culture um, Program in partnership with EDS. 
Um, in an effort to create a network of Indigenous studies scholars, um, we organize these weekly talks um, with a variety of speakers ranging from the programs, now at program instructors, U of U faculty, um, external academics, as well as current and past students. So today we're very excited to have Dr. Jeff Pines um, with us to share more on his research on Nahuatl linguistics. Uh, Dr. Jeff Pines has a, a bachelor's in linguistics from UC Berkeley and a PhD in linguistics from the University of Utah. Um, he's conducted a variety of research projects, including fieldwork with several North and Central American indigenous languages, most notably Nahuatl and Shoshone. Uh, Jeff specializes in, um, in Nahuatl linguistics and has conducted research specifically on Nahuatl and its relation to the encoding of spatial relations in the verb, color categorization, um, morphosyntactic parallelism, historical reconstruction through the oral tradition, and the linguistic structuring of some genres. Um, and he's currently working in translation. Um, so just as we have in these past weeks, we will have the presentation um, by Jeff, um, and we'll have about uh, 10 to 12 minutes at the end for questions and answers um, with the speaker. You can go ahead and put any of your questions in the chat, or if it's something you personally like to ask, um, you can go ahead and just type that you have a question, and I'll make sure to give you an opportunity at the, at the end. But I'll go ahead and turn the time over to Jeff. So he can tell us a little bit more about his presentation and dive right in. Thanks, Carrie. Mati Lu Nama Nimo Machilia Melawa Moneki ni Tlahu Wilia is the no no tlapanestilistli, no tlapas nestilis, ika nawatlatoliaske. But I I prepared my comments in English. Um, maybe partway through we'll slide into some Spanglish, but we'll start in English. Um, <laughs> and thank you again, both for your uh, introductions. And um, let's uh, let's see if I can share what I've got here and get started. Um, I hope you'll bear with me. I thought I would be able to work out the presenter view, so it may take me a little while to get everything straight with some of what I'm going to share here. Um, it looks like I won't be able to use presenter view now, so I have to remember what I had to say as I go through. Um, let's see. Okay. Does everyone see my my uh, presentation now? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Really. Um, so the, the basic idea, I, I was thinking about what I could share, and I was trying to think about what I, what I understand is the audience here. I know we have people from lots of different places, but I understand that this is still fundamentally a part of the Nahuatl summer, summer program, the, the intensive language courses. So I thought that I would share, um, instead of some in-depth research that's particular to my interests, I thought I would share a few ways that I've found what culture to be expressed through language. So these are these are three examples of ways that, as I was trying to study the language, other things came out to me, as opposed to things that I went in looking for, right? Um, so, uh oh, am I not able to? Ah, there, did the did the screen change? Sorry, still working out some of the technical bugs. Okay, so um, I I thought I'd start with this picture to say. The point is that I'm, I'm not going to talk so much about what my final conclusions are as what the journey was that got me there. And the reason I think that's important is that um, I know that especially when we talk about studying a language like Nahuatl, people sometimes ask, why? Why would you study a language like Nahuatl? I think there are a lot of good answers to that question. Um, and here, I, I don't want to give one final good answer. I want to share some of the things that maybe happened along the, along the path, along the road. And this is uh, this is near his his family's home in uh, in Westecatlali. Okay, so I'll I'll go through three separate stories or three three you know I'll relate three different experiences, um, and all of these have to do with some part of my experience in learning and some part of my experience relating to my teachers, many of whom are here with us now. 
lo siento que estoy hablando inglés, pero hay te pansi te sani lo seshke. And each of them, as I said before, I think led to some new understanding, at least for me, and in some cases, some, some research that I think has been interesting or valuable or that I think still will be um, when it finally gets finished. Um, the, the first place I want to start is talking about Chico Mishochit crossing the water. Um, I think some of you, maybe many of you, if you've taken several of the classes now, several of the language classes, are probably familiar with this story, I hope. Or if you're not, if you've studied history or if you've read any of the rest of the oral tradition, this is something that you may have come across in EDS um, uh, teaching materials, but it's also something that you may have come across in the Sandstrom materials, the things collected by Alan and, and uh, Pam Sandstrom in their field work. It's also found in a number of other story collections. Um, and I subtitled this, How to Paint Pictures in, with Words in Nahuatl. Um, so here's the story of Chico Menchochit crossing the river, right? Um, there are different versions, but the story begins with the idea that for whatever reason, Chico Mishochit needs to get to the other side of a large body of water. In some cases, I think it's actually described as like a, a sea or something like that. But the point remains that what we're talking about is he needs to get across. Now, if you're at all familiar with Chico Mishochit, you may already know he doesn't always have the best relationship with fish. He's had some bad experiences in the past. Um, so he's looking for someone or something that can carry him across the river. Um, in one of the versions, he meets Ayotzi. You may know Ayotzi. You can see him here, I hope. Ayotzi is the turtle. In one of the versions, he, he talks with Ayotzi, the turtle. And he, after begging and cajoling and, and um, convincing the, the turtle, Ayotzi, he eventually manages to get a ride on Ayotzi's back. And as he's going across the river, he's sort of playing around and bumping and thumping and hitting, and then all of a sudden Ayotzi feels something that tickles. And when they finally get to the other side, we learn that what's happened is that Chico Mishochit has drawn on the shell of Ayotzi. And I hope you can see here in the picture of our, our Ayot that you can see that just like Ayotzi in the story, he has the, the pretty markings where Chico Mishochit has made his shell beautiful and made the shell of all, all his, uh, his posterity beautiful. This is a reward. Ayotzi is very fortunate in this story in that Ayotzi gets a reward for serving Chico Mishochit for helping him to get across the water. Now, things don't always go as well for whoever helps out Chico Mishochit. Um, one of the versions that we have of crossing the water is when Chico Mishochit crosses the water on Ahetzpali's back. And here, I'll give you just a second. I'm, I'm not sure what everyone's level and comfort with texts in Nahuatl is. But I'll give you a second to read this. This is from um, Eduardo's book. I think Eduardo is here with us, if I'm not mistaken. Tlaxcamatito Compa. His, his book has um, lots and lots of really nice examples and really beautiful examples of the way that people speak when they speak well, elevated and beautiful discourse in Nahuatl. So, so here we have the story again of Chico Mishochit convincing Ahetzpali to um, ferry him across the river. And here I'll, I'll provide the translation. You might notice that I had bolded all of the, the verbs. And down here, I've italicized them in the English. So a rough translation into English is the little boy, or that little boy maybe, went along tickling the crocodile, punching it, kicking it, insulting it, or, or saying stuff, saying rude stuff to it, and laughing like that along on. And here I've translated Ahetzpali as crocodile. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, they say the creature, and that's that's Ekwani, that's the uh, that's Ahetzpali, was going along, getting angry because of the way that that he that's Chico Mishochit, was treating it. Um, but after a while, it was laughing too. So I take it to mean that we also have some tickling going on here with Ahetzpali as well. Right now, here I'm going to be a linguist for a second and ask whether you notice anything about all of those bolded verbs up there. And there are a couple of things you might notice, but if you know a little bit about Nahuatl, it might have caught your eye that all of them have the ending tih. Tih is not a real common ending, 
You might be familiar with it if you're an intermediate or an advanced student. You might be wondering if you're a, a lower level student what this is because you don't always see it right away and it's not really, really common. And yet here for some reason it's associated with every single one of those. Well, if you are one of those more advanced students, like I mentioned, you may recognize that tich is the, the ligature ending or the ligature, sometimes called the, the T ligature, T-I, and then it's combined with the verb ya yeah, or yoi, which is to go. Now, you're certainly familiar with that verb. You learned that really early on if you took classes. Um, sometimes we say that this means somebody is doing something in like an ongoing manner or that they keep doing something or they, they go along doing something. So I just wanna point out how different this is between the Nahuatl and what it looks like in the English here. So I, I've translated the little boy went along tickling the crocodile, um, which is kind of what it says, but literally it's kind of like he went along tickling it. He went along hitting it with his hand. He went along hitting it with his foot. He went along saying things to it. He went along, I don't know, laughing or giggling there on the, the back of Achitzpali. Um, and then at the same time, when we talk about Achitzpali, it says he goes along getting angry, which in some contexts might mean he's getting progressively more and more angry. And he goes along, it's, he goes along getting angry because of how the boy goes along treating it. And after a while, he goes along laughing as well. So you notice that a direct translation really doesn't work at all here, right? It doesn't make very much sense. Um, I'm going to suggest, and <laughs> if you want to discuss it more in depth, then I guess we can dig out my dissertation. Um, but I'm going to suggest that what's going on here is that the verbs are not actually being conjugated to tell you something about the action, other than to tell you what the trajectory is. So remember that as we're telling this story, we're talking about um, someone who's, who's fording a river. You're, you're, you're floating across a river on the back of a Hitzpali, right? So the going along is an indication of the movement, not really of the, the way that the tickling or the hitting or the kicking is going on, but in fact, it's a description of the entire setting. The entire setting is shifting over time here. And we're, we're getting to the point where we get from one side of the river to the other side of the river, right? Now, um, I won't belabor the point because like I said, if you, if you want to, we can discuss that later. You can ask me more questions about it or whatever you'd like to later. But I'll just tell you, this is not the only place this happens. This is one of the places where it became very clear to me just because of the disjoint between what the, the Nahuatl looks like and the way we would go about saying or describing something like this in English. But this is far from the only place that we find these, uh, these pieces of information added to the verb that set the, the setting or that describe the way that um, movement or space is being used and where people are over the course of the things we're discussing. Some of the other examples of these that also come from Eduardo's book are a description of the man who will eventually sell out his, his heritage and his patrimony and suffer because of that, um, who is described at the beginning when he's poor as Sankikistok Mila. Um, Sankikistok Mila means something like he was just out there whistling in the field, waiting, you know, and then the context is he's waiting to get work and he's working when there's work for him to do. Um, another example is from the story about Micha Ilwit, the, the festival for the Day of the Dead the man who does not follow the, the traditions sits down under a tree and we're located directly under a tree. And then he hears that there are voices around him. Someone is talking in his vicinity. And then um, after that, we hear that, in fact, we get the conversation and the conversation is a procession of spirits who are walking along in a line uh, beneath where he is, right? So, so he hears them first in general around a specific point and later down a particular line. Now, I'm not sure if you can see my video feed in addition to my, um, my screen that I'm sharing, but if you can, you might notice that I'm sort of instinctively without thinking about it, making a number of different hand gestures. I wanna suggest that um, sometimes we see a difference between two languages like this, and we think, oh, that's so strange. It does things so differently. Um, I would say, English probably has the resources to explain all of these things. The difference between English and Nahuatl is not, ooh, you, you mark something strange and different, but instead 
we encode things that in English we might show through gesture, through moving our hands or our body or our position, our, our, the direction we're facing or where we're looking. Um, we, we incorporate that information, but we do it in a very different way. Now in Nahuatl, to, give a, to tell a good story in Nahuatl, we're actually incorporating the same kinds of things that might be found in hand gestures or that might be found in other kinds of expressions directly onto the verb in Nahuatl. Okay, now um, let's, let's cycle back. We, again, we can talk more about this spatial stuff in the questions and answers if you're interested. But let's cycle back and ask a question. Um, what's Ahetzpali? Who's Ahetzpali? We, we know who Ayotzi is. There's no real mystery there. Ahetzpali is really interesting because Ahetzpali is a bit of a mystery. And if you look him up in different dictionaries and such, you'll find that um, he's not always listed. He, sometimes he has an unlisted number, right? Not everybody knows Ahetzpali. And if they do, a lot of times you get descriptions like he's an aquatic monster, right? He's, he's something strange. I don't know what he is. Now here, I, I'm going to relate a little bit of direct experience and <laughs> I, I found that when I talked to my teachers, including those who are here with me now, and when I asked about Ahetzpali, they were quite adamant that this was not a mythical monster. Ahetzpali is not something made up. It's not a dragon. It's not a monster. Ahetzpali is very specifically an animal that lives in the river, that swims in the river, that looks a lot like a, a big lizard, you know, and notably, Ahetzpali is the one that doesn't have a tongue. Hmm. Um, <laughs> so you might already know a lot about the biology of big lizards, but you might not. <laughs> it turns out there is a big lizard-like thing in the rivers in Veracruz, and that's a crocodile. Crocodiles don't have tongues. That's really important because a part of the story of Ahetzpali I mentioned before that Ayotzi got a reward for helping Chico Mishuchit. Ahetzpali did not get a reward for helping Chico Mishuchit. Ahetzpali got his shining tongue cut out. So here you have Ahetzpali. And here you have Ahetzpali's tongue. After being ferried across the river, Chico Mishuchit asked Ahetzpali to come back. He saw that when Ahetzpali would laugh, his tongue would shine and flash. And he cut the crocodile's tongue out. And this is a form of an ideological parable or an ideological fable, right? This is like a just so story. It's telling you why, if you understand why the crocodile has no tongue. And it tells you where to find the crocodile's tongue. And there it is. The crocodile's tongue is lightning. When the thunder god saw that Chico Mishochit was, was playing with this crocodile's tongue, which was bright and flashy, they loved it. And they went and they, they, would, they would make their thunder every time they saw it. And Chico Mishochit said, here, you can take it. So the thunder gods flashed the lightning from the crocodile's tongue to warn children, hey, the thunder is coming, don't be afraid, right? So this is a story that explains something about the world from the perspective of a, a traditional uh, Nahuatl worldview, right? Okay, so <laughs> you might wonder, why is he talking to us about crocodile biology and flashing tongues? Well, it turns out that can actually be useful information, though it might not seem like it at first. Um, one other experience that I had that, that I think has been a lot of fun is discovering the lost tongue of Sipakli. Do any of you know who Sipakli is? I guess I'm not totally used to having everybody muted here, um, but this is Sipakli. <laughs> Sipakli is one of the day signs on the calendar, in fact, the first one. Sipakli, like Ahetzpali, is often described as a monster, usually described as an earth monster, right? So, and here you see him, and you'll notice that he's, um, well, he's green and spiky, okay, and you'll notice that he has a tongue. Now, you might notice if you look closely that there are a few things you can see about that tongue, right? It's forked, and uh, notably, it's got like three or more colors in it, right? So he has a colorful forked tongue. So this goes along with the usual stories about Ahetzpali being um, a, an earth monster, right? And in fact, um, here is a picture of uh, Huitzilopochtli and, um, what's his name? And um, see, this is where my notes would help. <laughs> 
And um, well, we'll come back to that. I'll remember in a second. I think Tezcatlipoca. Oh, in some versions it is Tezcatlipoca, but I believe in this one from what Allison told me, oh. if I remember, it's actually, um, what's his name? Um, Lalo, you mean? No, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just, you mean, you I'm mean just the, blanking. I'm, you mean the rain god? You mean the rain god on the crocodile? Or? Yeah, it's okay. I'll come back. I'll remember later, and then I'll feel really dumb because it's one of the yeah. names I should really remember. But that's okay. And thanks for for helping. And and certainly Tesco Tescatlipocat is um or. Yeah, is, is a major player in a lot of versions of this story as well. So this is a story like the last story that we discussed. It's a story that's told in different ways. And you can see them um, attacking and, and killing uh, Sipatli here. And here you can see, um, th again, thanks to Allison, Allison Kaplan, who worked on this topic with me and without whom I don't think I would know half of what I know about any of this and who would certainly be ashamed of me for not remembering who I'm looking at here. But she's got a nice restoration of this image here that I, I borrowed. Um, and you can see that what's happening is you've got plants growing up out of Sipakli. So Sipakli dies in the story to create the earth. He, there's, there's water and this is a water existing thing, but he's an earth monster, not a water monster, because his body becomes, the, the ridges become the mountains and his body becomes sort of open space and fields. And you can see things growing there. This is, this is the creation of the earth in important ways, right? Okay, so as I mentioned before, here I'm gonna go back a little bit. As I mentioned before, here you've got this scary monster with a, a shiny tongue. Okay, now what the stories don't tell you is anything about that tongue. And if you look at all of the other day signs in the calendar, and in fact, if you look at lots of other illustrations and discussions of anatomy in the Nahuatl context, what you're going to find is, um, Tongues count as, this is a real part of your anatomy. This is not something where we, we make something strange up. You get a tongue and you get a tongue like the tongue you have. And in fact, Ajetzpali seems to be related to Quetzpali, the word for iguana, which is actually one of the kinds of, of lizard that does indeed have a forked tongue. So putting a big forked tongue on this monster seems to be associating it with a certain kind of lizard um, and yeah, this is a big one, obviously. It needs to be something big enough that it's reasonable to think of it as creating the world, right? Okay, um, so here are a whole bunch of different depictions of Sipakli, right? And you'll notice that some have tongues and uh, some kind of prominently don't have tongues or lower jaws for that matter. And here again, I'll, I'll just say thanks to Alison Kaplan, who when we worked on this together, she put all this together and I kind of stole some of the slides we did together because they're so nice. You can see that the ones that come from Aztec sources from central Mexico, they pretty much all have tongues that are depicted in some way. And you'll also notice that there's a strong tendency for those very tongues to have multiple tongues. So then when we look at some of the things that come from, from other culture groups, you notice that there's maybe one exception, but for the most part, these are tongueless representations of uh, Sipakli, right? So I want to propose the following here. Let's take a look. This is a crocodile. This is Morlet's crocodile up in the Huasteca. Um, and you can see no tongue, no tongue to be seen. I want to propose that what we found in the oral tradition of the Huasteca actually sheds a, a little bit of light on the variation in the depiction of the tongue of Sipakli. And I want to propose too that um, Sipakli, like Ahetzpali, is not some fantasy monster. Sipakli is, you know, the big lizard that swims in the water and doesn't have a tongue. And sometimes, yeah, we draw him with a tongue like that because we know the story. And what's the story? Where is Sipakli's tongue? Well, I don't know where Sipakli's tongue is, but I've heard this story about Ahetzpali, and Ahetzpali has a forked tongue that has sort of bright, funny colors, and it turns out to be, oops, it turns out to be lightning, right? It's taken from him. It's part of a just so story to tell you about how the world works and it's lightning. So I want to propose, I don't think there's any way I can prove this without any shadow of a doubt, right? But that's not really the, uh, the standard that we hold history to. Um, but I want to propose that it's a reasonable thing to think 
that from the oral tradition of the Huasteca, we can reconstruct an important piece of what is otherwise essentially lost oral tradition from central Mexico, right? I think that the idea that a part of the, the creature that becomes the world, the tongue, would be a forked tongue with a funny color, which would be lightning, fits very well with a story we already know if we've paid attention. But <laughs> to find that out, you have to pay attention to the story and you have to ask your teachers and find out something like, no, that's not a fantasy water monster. That's actually a thing that swims in my river, right? And if you don't listen to that and believe it, you'll never know. So I see that I don't have a whole lot of time left. So I'm going to run through one last example. Um, but this one is actually ongoing research where the last two are things that, that have been worked on and I've studied them and, and prominently, like I've mentioned a couple of times with Alison Kaplan, she and I put together some, some research, which she really did the lion's share of the, the art history and the, the sort of imagery part on uh, all of that. Um, but one other, this is like an active project that actually she and I have been working on as well as a few other people who've been involved from time to time. I, I wanna talk about describing things in Nahuatl in general. So if you've taken classes for at this point through the summer, if you've taken any at all, I'm sure you're familiar with some color terms, right? And I'm sure you've heard the word Ishnes Kayot. Um, let's talk about how you describe things in Nahuatl. You'll find that the internet loves Los Colores and Nahuatl. And if you Google it, or if you look around on Facebook for it or whatever, you can find that one, okay? But if, if you don't like the crayons, you can find that one, <laughs> right? Um, if, if you look closely, I, I won't run through all of them because we're running out of time here. If you look closely, you'll find that there are some that match. You'll find that there are some that are a little different. And you'll find that there are some that are just like, I don't know, we decided we wanted, um, Tlasa Lualtik as um, uh, one of our pink colors, right? That one's actually new to me. So lest you think that um, I just pulled two images, let's just keep going. Round two, here's another way of doing colors in Nahuatl, right? And again, you'll find most seem to be relying on caustic for yellow, but other than that, you get a whole lot of variation and even yellow has variation when you look further, right? And um, here's another that I thought was kind of pretty. So for some, for some reason, people really like putting together these colors in Nahuatl, um, but for some other reason, these colors don't seem to all line up. Um, historically, I, I'm gonna talk here for just a second and then I've got a little more in the slide. Historically, people have really enjoyed going out and gathering color terms. So this is a thing linguists in particular, certain kind of linguists like me actually, really love to go out and get a list of color terms. And there's been some really productive and really interesting research on color terms. And some of the conclusions have been that languages often develop basic color terms in particular patterns. We've determined that those patterns follow uh, information about hue. So it's particular parts of the spectrum, right? That are likely to split at different points. So you can talk about different stages in the development of a color system. And for the most part, when you look out across the languages of the world, this seems to be very descriptive. So let's jump back into Nahuatl again and say, um, we've got some rules. We think colors work in a certain way. We think they become abstract over time. So there's a particular word for a color and it doesn't mean other things. They, um, they develop in a particular order and they really just mean the color. The closest word to color in Nahuatl is Ishneskayot, which might mean color. Except that when you start asking people about the Ishnes Coyote of different things, you find that a lot of the answers that you get are like striped and polka dot. Um, if you keep pushing pretty soon, you're going to point to something and someone will describe it as <laughs> Xochipic, uh, floral print, I guess. It's flower color, right? It's not a particular color of a particular flower. No, they'll tell you that if it's the case. This is a flower-like thing or a thing that has flower patterns or images. My favorite of all, Ave, Tlaskamati <laughs> Tocompa, you gave this to me. My personal favorite is Kenihati. Um, <laughs> if you have a better translation for this now, you can share it. Um, it means, it looks like, you know, like that. <laughs> it, it, it tells you that it looks like something else that we're talking about or in that kind of a way. Um, is that a color? Probably not probably not in the way we use color in English and Spanish usually, right? 
And yet it fits in. And when you ask about the Ishna Skyot, that's a good answer. If you look out across historical sources, you'll find that um, these, these so-called color terms, really Ishna Skyot, will often be compared to fairly complex images, like the idea of braided cotton describing an old woman's hair, if I remember right, or a description of ripening chili peppers uh, describing the combination of green and red, but also a change of, of hue or, or of, of maturity or something. There are descriptions of things as being similar to a rainbow and pale. Um, you can find all kinds of interesting descriptions, but what you don't get is lots of examples that simply say, um, oh, it's red or oh, it's blue, right? In fact, um, you can find places in Central America today where you can find people describing mangoes or plantains as camulian, which may not be familiar in Nahuatl, but comes from Nahuatl camulewa, which means something like for a certain kind of thing to get ripe, like a certain kind of berry, something like that. Okay, I think we're, oh yeah, we're at time. So I'm gonna hurry through at the end here. Um, and in, instead, if you have questions about the color stuff, I think there's a lot more to say there, but we can talk about that later. But, but I just wanna throw a last little conclusion here at you. I want you to look at a picture and ask yourself, what do you see? What do you see? Okay, well, that's not as high resolution as I, as I hoped. Okay, so what I see is tolly. Tolly, you might know as being a word that has a root that means something like water reeds or a particular kind of plant that grows in ponds. Um, this is a root that, that we think we can probably reliably trace back to proto yudu aztecan It's a word people have used for a long time. In northern yudu aztecan the Takic languages and the, uh, the Numic languages out there in, in Utah, as a matter of fact, um, you get a reflex of this term that's something like doi, which is a word that refers to certain plants that have edible tubers that are useful as raw materials for weaving and for building boats. And generally speaking, the idea that goes along with doi is a place of abundance, a place where you have plenty of resources and plenty of good things, right? So jumping back, I see doi. I see lots of good raw materials and resources, right? Okay, so in Southern Yudu Aztecan and in Nahuatl principally, we also end up with this idea of tolan, the, the city of tulis, of, of, of tol, right? And this is a place where people, it's a metaphor, right? It's a place where people are as thick as reeds. That's the translation often offered and the explanation. Tolan is, is originally a city. It's where the Toltecs come from, right? Who are, who are great craftsmen. But it also means something like an urban center. Okay. Anyone who knows the phrase out in the Tulis in English, it comes from Spanish, right? It's um, found in, I think, the older generation in the Western United States. I think it originally comes out of, of uh, the Spanish of California. And out in the Tulis is a phrase where I, I don't think most people recognize the word Tuli on its own, but out in the Tulis, for the people who know, refers to a distant, unpopulated, unused area that's kind of going to waste. So what do you see? Do you see abundance? Do you see raw materials? Do you see dinner and a boat? Do you see reeds packed together where it looks like an urban center? Do you see a metaphor for an urban center? Do you see the, the object of fine craftsmen? Or do you see a place that's being wasted because you haven't turned it into something else? I'd like to conclude by suggesting that even though the effects or the ways that culture is expressed in language may be subtle in many cases, um, a lot of it has less to do with the definition. In all cases, tuli and tuli and, and tuli in, in English and Spanish and Nahuatl and the rest all means water reeds, right? The meaning of that word hasn't changed in thousands of years. But what you see when you use that word changes massively according to what your, your cultural background is. Depending on what eyes you see that, that pond through, depending on what eyes you have, you may see completely different things here. Okay, that's all I've got for today. Um, I'm sorry I went a little over. I hope we still have some time to discuss things. Thank you all very much and, and special thanks to all of my teachers and other past students and friends who I see here in the audience. Great, thank you so much for that presentation. That was great.
Um, we do have a few minutes um, to talk. If anybody else has questions, go ahead and put them um, in the chat. Um, I do have a, a question for you, Jeff. Um, so Ayesha says, Jeff, could I ask you to talk a bit more about the butterfly structure that you and Allison described during the summer program? Um, we are finding it in lots of our older Nahuatl documents. I wonder if you could talk more about its rhetorical force or forces um, to connect it to your theme today. Would you connect it to an aspect of Nahuatl culture? <laughs> Gee, who could have asked that question? John, you out there somewhere? Maybe someone else. Oh, really? Other yeah. people? Other people are hearing about this. Well, that's fantastic. Um, so I've mentioned Allison a couple of times. Allison was a student with me and we've collaborated on a number of these, these projects. She's a good friend. Um, she, she was actually my classmate with Abe quite some time ago now. Um, the, the structures we're talking about here, um, we, we noticed quite some time back at first that there were a few things that we would see in one and another different um, different text that we looked at. And, and one of the things, of, of course, I think most people are already aware that there are lots of different kinds of parallels that are going on in Noah's texts. And what we noticed is that in addition to the sort of matching one piece to another piece and one piece to another piece, like, like we see almost everywhere, there were also cases where things would sort of fold in on themselves and hit a center point and then fold back out. Um, and you could match, but you didn't match top to bottom, you matched sort of outside to outside and then mid to mid and then inside. And we found that um, in a lot of cases, it seemed like the point or the idea that was being communicated was found right there smack dab in the middle. Somehow that was an important position within what was there. Um, I, I would say um, it is clear that from, at least from what I've seen, it, it's clear that some of those things still exist in some modern rhetorical structures. So you can see little bits and hints of this in like um, some of the prayers, for example, that the Sandstroms have collected. Um, however, I don't think that we've seen anything in the contemporary texts that are nearly as complex and grandiose as some of the things in the, the older texts. Those are, those are really kind of a marvel to behold once you see how it, how it all works out, right? I, I think that um, e even though I haven't talked about this a lot today, just to draw broad parallels, something that's pretty important in um, older Nahuatl classical culture, um, and here, I mean, we're looking at Aztec stuff, but not exclusively Aztec stuff, is that you'll often find different kinds of binaries. You'll, you'll find opposition across um, two different things. You'll have male and female forms of a deity, or you'll have um, other kinds of pairings of that sort. So I think that um, even though it's a very different kind of parallelism, parallelism, even though it's not structured in the same way, I kind of feel like that's that's kind of the idea that when you when you turn things, it's a way of pointing, right? It, it, it's a way of structuring things such that it's an ornamentation instead of just a simple structure, and it's something that preserves that idea of symmetry um, by not simply repeating but by um, mirroring, mirroring back and, and shifting the order in that way. Yeah. I, I'm not sure how much more I could say about that because honestly, I feel like that's one of those places where um, we need to do a really good job of collating all of those things and going through and looking at the way that they, that they all match up. I, I also think, I mean, I, I hate to say this because it makes me feel like maybe I haven't done my job, um, but uh, I, I also think we haven't really found the upper bound so we've certainly found things that uh, structure like a sort of a paragraph level piece, something that, that certainly covers, you know, quite a few independent clauses or something like that. But honestly, I've wondered whether the structure may even spiral up even further than that to higher levels of discourse. Um, I've thought about this a little and a few times we've looked at like the larger structure of things like whole chapters or whole, whole subsections of like the like Sagun, right, something like that. But we haven't really done this. To my knowledge, I don't think anyone has done this really rigorously yet. And I feel like that's that's one of the questions to establish. Is this sort of like a local thing that you can do or something that structures a certain kind of a document? Certainly we saw a lot of it in like land titles and things like that, right? Or is it something that, that we could really use at even a higher level to structure narrative or organize ideas, something like that, right? I hope that's a helpful answer. Thank you. Um, and then 
So Stephen asks, um, has anyone listed the colors and organized them to help students understand how colors work in Huasteca Nahuatl? Well, you, you can find lists from in, in the materials, right, in the learning materials. I think the key is um, for a learner in particular, I think it, it can be a little bit a little bit scary to see the whole system in its entire sort of splendor, seeing just how, um, <laughs> how broad it can be. It can feel like there's no end, really. But in the end, I think that um, I think that the answer is to at least for, for teaching, right, for, for new learners is to maybe begin by learning them as colors, but but give the, um, I don't know, give, give the sort of proviso or the warning that the way that these things work in Nahuatl is not really the same as the way they work in Spanish or in English, right? So, so they're there, and, and certainly this, is, this goes back to the point that I made early on in discussing like the spatial stuff as well. I, it's an easy trap to fall into to think because this is different, it's exotic and, and strange and we can't do it here, or we don't do it here or something like that. And I don't think that's accurate because of course in English, we have plenty of resources for description. It's just that we use sort of discrete systems. We've got the, the system that is basic color terms and then we've got other kinds of metaphors and things. In Nahuatl, these things are mixed up in a way that is not always obvious when you first start. Because if you don't know all of the roots already and you learn the color terms, a chilcos starts out meaning orange. It doesn't start out meaning water or light, chill from chili, and cost from whatever the root is for caustic. That one is the big mystery. Maybe I shouldn't have used an example with cost in it. But it's, you know, some kind of jewelry or something. I don't know. We've got different answers from different places, right? But, but the point is, when you're a learner, it's easier to learn this is orange than to say, I put these different components together to describe what the concept of orange is, right? I'm, I'm not sure if that's helpful. I hope so. I'm sure it is. Thank you. Um, and we'll take um, just uh, we'll have this one last question and then we'll get all of you off to your classes. Um, Hunte, you had your uh, your hand raised. Um, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, sure. Did you ever check out the check out the, the Maya moon? It's about Tolo <laughs> that has an, that has an image of maize God crossing the water and even the maize God oh. maize God located locate himself at the top inside of total and even the total when I checked out the model again it has some kind of long lip like structure and even has some kind of fang and that and even the Mayanist already points out that the maze god of the mural mural has very similar has good has some similarity with the Popoluka maze god named Homshu and even the Homshu when I checked out it has also be a similarity with Chikumashochi greatly so so even when I also checked out the Chikmashochi test last year, even I feel the similarity among, the, among with the Homshu and even Mayan counterparts together. So yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I you might have found what I was looking for and didn't find. <laughs> we we definitely looked at crocodiles when when we we did the research. We definitely looked at uh, portrayals of crocodiles. Yeah. And, discussions of um, what we thought were similar stories across some of the other cultures like Maya cultures and other cultures found in Mesoamerica. Now we found, what I, I'll tell you, what I was really looking for is I was looking for a classical account of the God crosses the water story. It's like you might have found something like that. I found a, a maze God elsewhere crossing the water. I really wanted to have a classical version of Chico Mishochit with whatever yeah, yeah. wanted to give him, right? Um, but, but we didn't find that, but we did We did determine, I, I mean, it, it's pretty clear in the record that this idea of Sipakli, the, the world building crocodile, seems yeah. to be well dif diffused, right? This is something that a lot of people share. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if some of those other things are common. Um, like I said, we didn't, uh, our, our focus was on the crocodile end, not on the Chico Mishochi end, by the time that we were doing the, the classical research. Yeah, and regarding that, yeah, we got, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah. Regarding the crocodile, I, it, there's another, there's another cl classic resource since the Palenque creation story at the classic Maya directly mentioned the, how the, and the maize got an ancestor of the Chico Palenque dynasty, and cut down the, cut down the neck of the crocodile, which be, cut down the neck of a crocodile and make the fire a pony, and even that, 
these gold gas, the, even the bl blood from the crocodile become the ocean, become the ocean itself. So yeah. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And that's exactly the stuff that I'm talking about, where once you have a story where the body is like napped to the earth, the idea that the, the forked tongue that you don't see in modern crocodiles, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. lightning that you see from, from yeah. the sky, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really good. I'm, and I'm glad to hear that there were other cases where there were other matches of, of, of that same body, crocodile body to earth metaphor. Great. Right. Yep. Well, thank you all for your questions. Um, a huge shout out to Jeff, who not only did this presentation, but did it on a fairly short notice. And we're very grateful for that. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, close now and we'll have one more brown bag uh, presentation um, this next week. Again, that'll be um, from 1.40 to 2.30. Um, thank you again. And we'll see you next week then. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, um, uh, just an announcement for the advanced uh, classical now. It will take five minutes before we start in case somebody needs to go to the bathroom or get something to eat. Okay, so in five minutes, we'll connect. <laughs>